Hi, everybody. How's it going? Good. Oh. You? Good. Uh, I'm all right. Um, I'm under a ton of pressure uh, because I have my comprehensive exam in six days, so I'm going to spend this entire weekend studying all of the physics that I'm supposed to be good at. Uh, I took a practice test yesterday afternoon, and I, um, I did okay. Here's the bummer about it. You get a single letter grade for your comprehensive exam, and it gets factored into your GPA. Um, this one test carries the same credit for my GPA as a class, and you know what my GPA is right now in graduate school? No. I have a 4.0, and I would like to keep it that way. So on top of uh, wanting to pass so that I can graduate, um, I also want to get a perfect score so that I can graduate with a 4.0 clean. Um, I know it's dumb, and it's like a really dumb thing to worry about, but. Uh, Ah, I got it on the brain and I can't get it out. Uh, it's also my way of telling y'all I'm going to be a little um, fried next week. We'll see how next week goes. But yeah, I have to take that test on Thursday. And it basically starts right when my teaching day ends. So next Thursday, I have to take a test from 1 to uh, 7 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> it's wow. a six-hour test. It has one break in the middle. And then the last hour of it is verbal. There you go. Um, and so we're all under a lot of stress, not just like regular old school stress with the year ending, which we are under that regular school stress. Um, but we are also under the additional stress of all being stuck at home. Uh, and I'm going to give the same disclaimer like at the top of calculus every day. I always give a disclaimer that even though we're about to talk about investing, I am not a business professional and this is not a sale of a security stock, whatever, just because, you know, this is just for the sake of talking about it. On that topic, I'm not a mental health professional. I'm not giving you mental health advice. Uh, these are just fundamental basics. Um, but humans are social animals. Uh, and we have shown from psychological study that bad things happen to social animals when you isolate them from one another. Uh, and so be sure to take care of yourselves, children, like do some stuff that you'd like to do. Don't just like sit around all day and do homework and nothing else. Try and find something to make your day nice just for the sake of it. It'll make you feel better. And if you'll, you feel better, you will do better. Uh, I got some simple recommendations. So definitely exercise is a big one because on top of doing the exercise and it making you feel better, um, you get the nice like routine change. I don't know about you, but I've had a couple days already that we've been sheltering in place where I didn't bathe or change clothes all day. I like basically took a sick day where I woke up in my pajamas and I was like, I'm just going to play switch on the couch. And then I did that all day. And then I went to bed in those same pajamas. And when I realized that the next day I felt disgusted, uh, exercising is tight because it forces you to like take a shower and change your outfit afterwards. That's great. That's like worth its weight in gold. Um, also, try to get like a good change of pace going, add something new to your day, learn a new skill, check out and see if there's some like weird stuff on YouTube that you weren't learning about before. There's a whole bunch of weird stuff on there that's like totally worth going down a deep rabbit hole for. Mm -hmm. uh, lately, I've been watching this really long video series about a dude who does recipes from the 1800s and he wears like <laughs> colonial era clothing. Sounds dumb as hell, but it's a dope YouTube channel. If you want to check it out, it's called Townsend's. T-O-W-N-S-E-N-D-S. -E uh, it's crazy the way that people used to cook, like with the ingredients and the supplies they had back then. Super deep rabbit hole. Um, and the other thing that I've been doing to try and stay sane is I've been gardening. I've been gardening my butt off, like my whole um, gardening space has been utilized. And so I'm going to force y'all to look at my family photo of plants. Um, this first one, oh, and it also like shows you that I live in the most LA area ever of like, hey, look, these weird small suburban houses and also a bunch of palm trees. Mm -hmm. um, this is Mr. Jalapeno. He's producing jalapenos. And if you look in the top left corner, he's starting to be strangled by Mr. Green Beans, who's like reaching out for additional vine space. And then this is those said green beans. 
I planted a bunch of them in one planter and now they're growing into the whole trellis. So it's just going to be a solid rectangular prism of green bean growth. Uh, I got an avocado plant, which is starting to kick butt. It's like becoming a tiny tree. In 10 years, I hope to attach a hammock to it. Uh, in this thing, in the back, I got bok choy, which is like a Chinese leafy green. It's a good vegetable to grow because you can pluck out the outer leaves and let it keep growing and it'll just keep generating all season. And then in front of it, that weird little one is actually a little green onion. I don't know if you guys know, but if you plant the bottoms of the green onions that come from the grocery store, they just keep growing infinitely. And you can just keep trimming the top for fresh green onions with a pair of scissors. Uh, I got tomato. Uh, I think these peas are dying because it's getting too hot, but it's still making peas. I've grown like a full half pound of peas so far since um, we were all ordered to shelter in place. And then this is more green beans that I have growing up a walking stick because I ran out of stuff for my green beans to grow on. I'm just like farming green beans out there. Uh, I know that farming, I'm sorry, gardening is an old man hobby, but I hope that y'all do have some kind of hobby that you use to, you know, fill your time. Don't they fall off like the edge? Like the What do you mean? Like they don't fall off the edge of your belt. Oh, word. Uh, actually, that's a, I mean, you know, I don't like plugging products, especially if I'm not getting paid to plug them. Do you see the bottoms of the planters? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So they sell those things. It's great if you live in an urban space um, and only have a balcony to garden on. But the bottoms of those planters <clears throat> are cut like uh, this. So if you look at it edge on, they're cut like this. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I do is once you get them, if you don't know about gardening, you have to drill holes in the bottom of your pot so that there's drainage. So I only put holes on one side because I don't want to be rude and have like dirty water dripping down onto my neighbor's balcony. Mm -hmm. So only drainage on the inside where I can like put down a tray to clean it up. And then the reason why there's two is that if you have a wide banister like we do, uh, then it sits in here and is stable and doesn't shake. And then uh, if you have a skinnier banister, like a metal one, that's fine too. It'll fit up inside the higher part up here. It's actually really clever design. And since those hand railings are standard width, it's basically guaranteed to fit one of these two. Um, yeah, and I like, they're actually, it seems sketch. I found it to be really reliable, especially there was like a kind of an earthquake, like a big one-ish hit in like, was that October or August, September? Mm, I don't remember. Yeah, it was back in the fall, but um, they didn't get knocked down by that. So I guess that's probably like a pretty good test of how reliable they are. Mm -hmm. I trust them. I trust them. Uh, anyway, let's just go ahead and jump into it. So y'all notice uh, I already put up a spot to upload your classwork. Just tell me what you're doing to take care of yourself. Like go take a bath, feel better for a minute, right? Um, that's all I want for today's classwork because today we're just going to jump right into it. Today we're going to finish up that example that we ended with yesterday, the tennis ball, basketball thingum. We want to use momentum to prove that the tennis ball flies up higher than it started from based on Newtonian mechanics. And then we'll get into the tutorial for free response five. Uh, over the weekend, I'm going to assign the last two mandatory free responses for the class, and then we'll be doing those tutorials next week. Um, and also remember to give me the final tour of your laboratory notebook. That is the other assignment, which is live right now. Wait, Mr. Rob? Yes? Do you think uh, Animal Crossing is a good way to like waste your time? Yo, man, if you don't have access to a physical garden, having access to a digital garden scratches a lot of the same itches. When I'm not like in my actual garden, I play a game called Stardew Valley, which is just farming also. Uh, if it makes you feel better, if it makes you feel more sane, it's it's time well spent. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah for sure. Also, yeah. Did, have you visited Elijah Woods uh, Island yet? Elijah Woods Island? Oh boy, yeah. Take, a, take some time and Google it later. Somebody was on Twitter and they were like, hey, uh, parsnips are selling for 500 on my island. Does anybody want to come over? And then the dude got a direct message from Elijah Woods' like personal um, animal or Twitter account. And he was like, hey, man, can I come to your island and sell parsnips? And Elijah Wood has uh, Animal Crossing Island, which is open to the public if it's not already full. And uh, his little, like, villager looks exactly like him. It was a really good, wholesome story. Uh, check that. it out. Check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Visit Elijah Wood's island, and if you uh, uh, get in, 
it's busy now that everybody knows about it. But if you can get into Elijah Woods Island, let me know. Okay, um, thank you. Robinson? Yes. I have a question for my lab notebook. Yeah. So for the last lab, I sent you pictures of my graphs. Do you want me to just print them out, like print out the pictures and tape it in my notebook? Yeah, yeah. So for all of this stuff that like, because I don't know, sometimes I'm lax compared to how they're going to be next year in college about like, hey, you can just show me the two parts and I'll give you the credit for it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Put it together, put it together so that if you go to your college dorm room uh, in a few months and you're like, oh, Mr. Robinson accidentally or actually stole this lab from UCLA. I already have the write up here. I know how to do this, that all of the stuff is there when you flip to it. OK, but I didn't like leave a space for the pictures because I like you said we had we could send it so you can, can just I... attach it to the left hand side okay yeah just make it I mean make it to be used by your future self make it so that when you open it in the future you will be pleased by how it is laid out it's not for me it's for you okay thank you mm -hmm. okay uh, so let's go ahead and knock out the example from yesterday and then we'll do the tutorial for uh, free response five the conservation of momentum question that y'all should have done for homework so yesterday, we talked about the uh, physics teacher classic, which every physics teacher does, but nobody digs into the math of it because the math, as we saw yesterday, is nasty unless you plug in numbers. But, you know, we're trying to transition into college physics. So, you know, we took a crack at it, gave it the old college try. And so uh, we know that if I stack a tennis ball on top of a basketball and drop it, the tennis ball is going to go flying. This seems to defy the conservation of energy, but in fact, it doesn't because energy is conserved for the whole system. The tennis ball does end up with more energy than it started with, but that energy comes from somewhere that we can describe. Where does that energy come from? The basketball. It comes from the basketball. When they have this inelastic collision, energy and momentum are transferred from the basketball to the tennis ball based on the laws of elastic collisions, a combination of conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. So we break this up into three events. Number one, their initial velocities are given by the fact that I drop them together from rest. And so free fall gives us that initial velocity. Then they have the collision, which is the long math we did yesterday. Even though that's step two of three, it's 90% of the work. We are doing the elastic collision math, conserve energy, conserve momentum, substitute one into the other, and then do all of the algebra very carefully in order to get the final velocity of the tennis ball and then based on that final velocity, we can calculate the final height. So let's go ahead and wrap up that calculation. Uh, if you want more information on this, check out yesterday's video in the link. Oh my God, I'm gonna do the YouTube thing. It's in the link below. I'm gonna link it to this video, that's great. Um, and so you can look at how we did the math for these first two parts. Wait, I have to remember to link, hold on. Let me add it to my to-do list. Link AP physics video, okay. Um, and that's funny. And uh, we got to a point where this was our equation. Uh, we said that zero was equal to 11 velocity of the tennis ball squared minus 0 0.8 root 2 gh velocity of the tennis ball minus some constant written out in g's and h's. We agreed that this was a quadratic equation and as a result to solve it, we need to use the quadratic equation because there's a v squared and a v. And so we're going to say that this is A, this is B, this is C, and then we'll use this equation here in order to solve for what the final velocity of the tennis ball should be. And so the velocity of the tennis ball, and I'm just going to, I'm going to assume we all have this note here. Does anybody need a second? Okay, I'm going to move on to the second page, just assuming that we all have that on the side ready to go. So we're going to take those bits and pieces and plug them into the quadratic equation. So the velocity of the tennis ball should be equal to negative b, and b was negative. So negative negative will be positive 0 0.8 root 2gh, uh, plus or minus, which is how we are going to get two answers. And this is a really out there question. Do you all remember from when we did this in class? How is it that I'm getting two velocities of the tennis ball? What are my answers going to look like? How is it like logically we can get two velocities for a tennis ball? In reality, it can't have two velocities at the same time. So what two velocities are calculated by this equation? If anybody knows, uh, I like- Is it initial and final? That's excellent. 
when you do this math, you always, I would, you know, if we were in class, I'd give you a crisp $2 bill because everybody loves that for some reason. <laughs> it's like a bunch of goodwill and all it costs is $2, but it's worth so much more than $2 when it's in your hand. It feels like it's worth three. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason why this equation calculates two velocities is that whenever you do this right, one of the uh, velocities is going to be your initial velocity. The other velocity is going to be your final velocity. You get two answers, but it's really easy to figure out which one is which. Um, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is going to be negative 0 0.8 root 2gh quantity squared minus 4ac, 4 times a, which was just 11 because we canceled out all the masses using that nifty trick I showed y'all, uh, times c, which is going to be times negative 20.4 gh. And then all of this is then divided by <clears throat> 2a, uh, 2 times 11. And so I'll go through and we'll clean this up as much as possible before we start forcing values onto it. So it's going to be 0 0.8 root 2gh plus or minus the square root of, well, this thing I can square. So 0 0.8 squared will become 0 0.64. And since we're squaring a negative, it becomes positive. And what's root 2gh squared? 2gh. Yeah. Times 2gh minus, and then over here, I can combine all of these constants. A negative, negative becomes positive. And then it's going to be 4 times 11 times 20.4. Uh, which is going to give us 897.6. G H plus, and then all divided by 22. Um, and then, yeah, notice in here, right, these two values, this is in terms of G H, and this is in terms of G H also. So everything inside here, I can actually all fit together with one uh, number. So it's going to give us uh, 897. 0.6 plus uh, 0 0.64 times 2. So our new constant on the inside is going to be 898.88, so 0 0.8 root 2gh plus or minus the square root of 898.88 ghs all over 22. And so I can take the square root of this digit and pull the digit out and add or subtract that with 0 0.8. So I'm going to take the square root of that last constant, uh, which I get as being about 29.98. And so this is going to give me uh, 0 0.8 plus or minus 29.98. I'll round it off there, times root 2gh all over 22. Oh, that's weird. There is a mistake in my answer. I'm gonna tell you what it is because I worked this out on the side. This lead digit right here is supposed to be eight. I lost a factor of 10 in that first digit. And if somebody can uh, find out why and email me where this fell apart in the math, uh, I don't know, I'll give extra credit for it, even though none of you probably need it, but you could try. And so the reason uh, why this works out so nicely is that this is a wacky decimal due to rounding errors, right? Uh, but if this was 30, right, what's uh, 8 minus 30? 22. Negative 22. Uh, negative 22 divided by 22 gives us negative 2gh. That was its initial velocity when it had the impact, right? Mm -hmm. So that means when it bounces upwards, what velocity is it going to have? What's the other final velocity that it'll have? What's 8 plus 30? 38. So the other final velocity will be 38 over 22 root 2gh. And this is a super elegant answer for a couple different reasons. Number one, we know it has units of velocity root 2gh has units of velocity, and this doesn't carry units, so that won't change it to anything incorrect. 
and is this fraction greater than or less than one? Greater. Greater than. And that's how we know that it must bounce higher. It's Wait, uh, Mr. Um, yeah. Um, I got to where you put the point, the point eight rad two gh plus minus twenty nine point eight. Mm -hmm. But I did um, 0.8 rad 2 gh plus minus 29.8 rad gh over 22. Oh, yeah. So, like I said, I made some mistake yesterday in the notes somewhere, and I'm going to have to go backwards in order to locate it. I'm off by a factor of 10. Uh, this is in error. Uh, I made a mistake somewhere along the way. This shouldn't be 0 0.8. Something in a previous step should have made it just 8. I made a mistake. Oh, okay. So something leading up to the formation of this digit uh, is incorrect. And I'm like staring at the notes from yesterday trying to figure out exactly where, but I can't see it and I don't want to meditate on it that much longer. You know what? I think it was lost here in the step where I factored in the 10. I'll let y'all look for it, and if I find it, I'll post uh, notes on Classroom about it. But yeah, I made some mistake yesterday in the determination of that lead term. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, that is more detail. I, I never, who could have thought that there was so much information when I drop a tennis ball on top of a basketball, right? Seriously. Um, okay. So let me log into uh, the college board in my other window here real quick, and then we'll get going on the tutorial. Um, Mr. Robinson, yesterday you said to remind you that I need a planner schedule. Oh, that is right. Yep, that's the other thing that I wanted. Yes, and actually right now is a perfect time to do it since we are transitioning from one thingum to some secondary thingum. Um, so let me start off first with the dates of class that I'm already going to be canceling for all of y'all. So uh, you guys have AP government, oh, give me one second, let me copy paste this because I can't like chew bubble gum and talk. I have to do this first before we go over it so I don't say all the wrong things. Um, okay, so uh, who has AP government? I do. Okay, so that's on Monday the 11th, correct? Yeah. Okay, so uh, of course there will be no class that day for anybody. Uh, and normally I not, the, my policy is I give you the day of the test and the day immediately before. Since it's on a Monday, we have that Sunday off anyway. Who has AP literature? Me. Me. Okay, so you have that on the Wednesday of that week, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there will be no class of any kind on Tuesday. Uh, on Wednesday, class will be uh, well, what time is your test? Is it afternoon or morning? Mm -hmm. Morning. For, for which English, one? English, right? AP literature, yeah. Pretty sure it's in the afternoon. Um, okay. Um, if it's in the <laughs> afternoon, huh? We're Pacific time, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 11 a.m. Yeah. Oh, 11 a.m. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do then for that day. Uh, it's Wednesday, so there won't be class, and I don't want anything to come even close to your AP test or whatever. But on that Wednesday, I'm going to hold one final office hours before the AP test in the evening. Uh, and let's see, it'll be Wednesday. I'll be just about done with school. Actually, that'll be final weeks for me. So for right now, I'm going to tentatively schedule on that Wednesday a um, like a 4 p.m. office hours, like right before dinner. I can push it later if you guys need, but for right now, we'll start it at 4 p.m. And if there's a conflict and you want to talk that day, let me know. I just want to make sure that we get one last chance to ask, uh, ask any very last minute questions. Um, and then AP Physics, AP Test is that Thursday. So of course we have no class then, but if you want to meet for just office hours, you know, holler at me and I'll host. Um, are there any other AP tests for y'all? Yeah, I have cal calculus. Oh, what day is calculus? Um, not even sure. Sorry? It's on the 12th. I think it's, oh, 12? Okay, I thought it was 11. Yeah, they're all back to back. Oh, 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 so it's the same day as lit. 
Is that no, the same day as the day before? Oh, it's the day before. Okay, so AP calculus. Uh, no class, so that's on that Tuesday. And, um, you know, if you guys need hit help with AP Cal, I can help you with that too. If you ever have questions or want me to do an office hours about it, just let me know and I'll schedule a time. Um, and then after that, we're done. So that Friday after AP tests, we're not going to talk about stuff at all. On Friday, we'll start doing coffee stuff, which is also what we'll do on Monday. I'll just talk about uh, coffee facts and tutorials. Coffee is the second most traded commodity in the world after oil that you didn't know that unless you were also in calculus. Um, uh, so that we don't have to, yeah. And then uh, I will do a tutorial for the AP test itself. Like I'll just solve those questions out whenever the college board says it's okay. They always have like a mandatory wait period where you're not supposed to talk about it with your class. But as soon as the college board says, hey, it's fine to go over these questions with your class now, then we'll go over that stuff. Uh, but yeah, so week of AP tests, no class Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And then Friday, we'll just hang out and talk about coffee. Yeah, and I'll also schedule a Saturday. So we'll also do Saturday the 9th. Uh, of course, not mandatory, optional. I'll hold a mon uh, morning office hours that Saturday so that you can get uh, questions in. And if you guys want any additional like Zoom time or whatever, uh, just shoot me an email and I'll uh, make a posting on Classroom so that everybody can join. It's up to you. Um, is that okay? So that would be next Saturday that we'll be having an extra session. All right. All right, cool. Uh, I think that's everything. And of course, you know, if anything changes, let me know. And with the time that we have left, let's probably do just the first one out of the two on Unit 5. Um, Oh boy, my application to graduate. I just got a pop-up notification that says uh, I'm gonna be allowed to graduate. Yay. Congrats. I, yeah, I guess. I mean, it was guaranteed or whatever. It's just that they like approved the paperwork because I turned it in hella late. And actually the due date for the application to graduate, I mean, I don't wanna be accusing nobody without evidence, but um, the deadline to submit the application to graduate was October 15th. And if you submit the application to graduate anytime after October 15th, you have to pay a late fee on it. Like, yo, that was before my wedding. Like I was never going to make that deadline. Um, okay. Anyway, uh, unit five free response. Uh, and this is going to be the first question of the two. We'll do the other one on Monday. Um, oh, also, sorry, one last, uh, God, this is just a podcast. It's just me rambling, man. Um, one last thing, if you didn't know, LA County is doing widespread COVID testing. Uh, you can file online to do it on the county website. And me and my wife both applied, and I don't know how, we're both getting seen today already. Um, they're, yeah, I guess. I mean, I'd rather know than not know, especially since like right before we were all ordered to shelter at home. Mm -hmm. One weekend I went to the Bernie rally. The next weekend I ran the LA Marathon. Also, I attend two large schools, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I am a prime candidate for somebody who is going out and doing too much. Um, we just want to know if we've already had it or whatever. So uh, we were able to apply online. It's at Dodger Stadium. You just drive up and then they swab the inside of your cheek with a cotton swab and then they get results back to you in four days. Um, so if you have been working a job that is out there in the world and you would like to know uh, what your like status is, or if you have parents who are still going out to work, I just want everybody listening to know that um, should you desire a test, you can do it through the LA County website in its drive up. Uh, anyway. Uh, a block rolls down a ramp, and whenever you see a ramp that looks like that, uh, what alarms should go off in your brain whenever you see this kind of parabolic ramp? We can't use the ramp equations here. 
you can't do it. It's literally not possible. You can't use mg sine theta or mg cosine theta because it's not a totally flat ramp. What's the only way to figure out the final velocity of block X? Uh, energy transformations. It's, it's yeah. got to be conservation of energy. Only uh, on a flat ramp does mg sine theta and mg cosine theta work. But for this parabolic ramp, the only relationship we have that holds is uh, conservation of energy. So based on the height it was dropped from, we should be able to say something about the velocity of block X. Now, uh, I'm not saying that because I know something about the question. Uh, I'm saying that right now because whenever you see a curvy ramp, your brain should be like, oh, right, conservation of energy. It's my only way. Um, nonetheless, uh, we set it up in this uh, orientation. Uh, and this is one of those lab questions, <clears throat> which is why we did the collision lab with the carts. This is the same thing, right? Um, you were supposed to graphically determine the relationship between the release height of block a X and the speed at which the two block system transfer or moves to the right after they collide and stick. Stick being the important operative word. And of course, uh, this is to say, this is what type of collision? Elastic. Elastic or inelastic? Inelastic. Yeah, this is inelastic. So it's important to appreciate that at the moment of impact right here, they have an inelastic collision, uh, which of the two types of collisions, as we just saw from that really long tennis ball, basketball derivation, that uh, an elastic collision is much more heavy mathematically. We like inelastic. Inelastic is the easy. Mm -hmm. um, so part A, one, uh, what principles do we need? Michael already gave us the first part. We need conservation of energy. Uh, and that is to be able to figure out how fast block X will be moving as it moves from the top to the bottom. And then what's the other principle or relationship that we're also going to need? We don't need momentum, right? You do, because there's a collision. Oh, but I thought inelastic only energy was conserved. Other way, when it's inelastic, oh. only momentum is conserved. Oh, momentum. Oh, yeah. So we're going to need both of these. And yesterday, the same way um, uh, we talked about, <clears throat> sorry, I can't talk and write at the same time. Uh, yesterday, when we talked about breaking up the tennis ball basketball thing into events, the reason why I talked about it yesterday is that this problem is broken up into the exact same events. An object is driven by gravity, and then a collision occurs. And so we have to deal with our calculations in two phases and substitute, is that loud? And substitute them into each other. Um, so past these two, I would assert that that would be a complete answer to part 1A. These are the only relationships you need in order to do this whole thing. Now, if you also said kinematics, sure. Yeah, that could help you depending on how you solve this, but I'm going to show that you can solve this with just these two. Uh, however, adding any unnecessary ones, if you were like, oh, we also need the torque equation. Dog, nothing is rotating. Any unnecessary concepts added in here would actually lose you points, so be sure not to just like spitball it. Number two, we want to derive an equation which tells us how these things are going to move after the collision where they define the height of block X's original position as HX. So this is item two. So like I said, number one, it falls down. So there's gonna be some first event. And then number two, they have their inelastic collision. And so we're gonna solve this as two problems. How do I use conservation of energy to get the final velocity of block X? Number one, conservation of energy. What kind of energy does it have at the start? Potential. It has uh, gravitational potential, oh, and yeah. gravity is going to pull it down. So that's going to be mass of x, gravity, height of x. That's just mgh, but with our specific values in there. Mm -hmm. And as something begins to move, it becomes the energy of motion, which we call kinetic. Kinetic, which is based on the Greek word for motion, kinos. Uh, but nonetheless, oh boy, I always have to remember this is on YouTube. Uh, I don't care how it's actually pronounced, native Greek speakers. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I do. Anyway, equals one half mv squared. And of the stuff here, what should we be looking for? V squared. We're looking for the final velocity of x once it falls down all this way. Mm -hmm. I'm going to solve for that. 
Like most things driven by gravity, we know we're on the right track because the mass is irrelevant. All things are accelerated equally by gravity. It is not uh, racist. Um, at least it's not racist against mass. Uh, and then to solve for V, we just multiply both sides by two and take a square root, a very common solution. Notice this is the same as the one yesterday for dropping an object straight down. Mm -hmm. The velocity of an object accelerated by gravity is equal to root two G multiplied by the height from which it was dropped. So here's what this is telling us. Block one during event one, I'm sorry, block X during event one falls down the ramp and then it has a collision with block Y and at the moment it collides with block Y, it has a velocity equal to root 2gh. So this equation is telling us the higher we drop it from, the faster it is moving by the time it collides with block Y. And I think that's reasonable, right? The higher you drop something from, the faster it goes. Mm -hmm. Number, uh, sorry, event two. Now we have to conserve what? Momentum. We now have to conserve momentum. And so here's our uh, conservation of momentum equation. Mass x v x naught plus mass y v y naught is going to be equal to mass x v x plus mass y v y. And I have made a mistake. Tell me what it is. You have to show that velocity shows direction. Uh, velocity will show direction, and we'll take that into account in a moment. That's actually kind of automatic. Uh, the mistake that I have made is something about the type of collision. In an inelastic collision, objects are going to hit and they're going to stick. So how many objects do we end up with? With one. So there's only one velocity, right? Mm -hmm. If you look here on the right, uh, this is saying that we're going to end up with two objects moving separately at two separate velocities. However, in reality, if they end up hitting and sticking together, then they're both going to finish with the same velocity, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of calling these individual velocities in the end, we'll just call them the same velocity. Boop, boop. We actually just end up with mass x moves with a final velocity and mass y moves with a final velocity. And now that these are the same term, I can factor it out. And so this is telling us that mx vx naught plus my vy naught is going to be equal to mx plus my, the total mass of one combined object, then multiplied by their final velocity that they move with together. That's why it always simplifies down to this, because if they hit and stick together, they're now moving with the same velocity, and that can get factored out. Um, wait, who was talking about uh, the direction of the vectors? Was that Susan? Yeah. Okay, so uh, go ahead and pick for us a direction. To the right, do you want that to be positive or negative? Oh, positive. Okay, so uh, the nice thing about this nomenclature is that it automatically captures signs. So if we say movement to the right is positive, is this velocity positive or negative? Positive. Positive, and just kind of conceptually, if you have an object that's not moving and it gets smacked by another one, they're gonna keep moving that same direction together, right? Mm -hmm. So conceptually, would you expect this system to move to the left or the right? All right. right. Yeah, your head movie, you should guess that this moves to the right, which would be in the positive direction. So the math will bear out that as long as we plug in a positive velocity, we get out a positive velocity. Uh, one of these numbers is zero. Which one is zero? Oh, the V sub O of the stationary mass. The Y one? Yeah, because that block, the one that's waiting to get uh, plowed into, is uh, starting off at rest. So mm -hmm. this is zero, because it's zero times whatever mass Y is. And we're solving for this final velocity. So from the second equation, we get that mx vx naught, the initial velocity of x, divided by the total mass, mx plus my, that's equal in the end to the final velocity. So here's what this is saying. The final velocity gets bigger if x is moving faster. That makes sense. The faster it comes in, the more momentum it's going to have, the faster the total system is going to move. And what happens to the final velocity if my gets bigger? It decreases. If you're trying to move something bigger, you won't go as fast. So if mass y is bigger, if you increase the denominator on the left, it makes the numerator on the right smaller. So this equation seems to match conceptually what should happen in our brain if we change the variables. 
we're one step away from the final answer to this part, and this is the most physics-y part of this question. We wanted one equation in the end, so what do I substitute? The V equation we got from the energy. Into? The V. Right there. So the height is going to determine the velocity at the moment of collision, and this is the velocity at the moment of collision. So to get one final equation of, well, this isn't an equation of motion, this would technically be considered a fundamental equation. You'll learn the difference next year. Uh, but mx root 2g hx divided by mx plus my is going to be equal to our final velocity. Oddly enough, this is the exact same uh, calculation that we did yesterday, except instead of having a very complex system of dropping followed by a complex collision, this is a simpler falling down and a simpler collision, but it's the same logic. Two events, two equations, substitute. Uh, are there any questions on this solution here for item uh, 2A? No. no? Okay. Um, so now let's go ahead and talk about different solutions that we could have for uh, B. Um, yeah, different, different solutions that we could have for uh, B. So you are now asked to do this in the lab. So you are given this experimental setup and you're asked to do this. So we need to know not only uh, what do we measure, so quantity, uh, associated variable, uh, and then device. Uh, what do we need to collect if we're actually going to do this? And I, I guess I should have said this explicitly a long time ago or whatever, but use the equation from whatever question came previously. This is our checklist. We basically need to find a way directly or indirectly to capture each one of these values so uh, tell me what to write. How do we capture these values? We need um, sweet height too. Okay, we, we definitely need the height. That's one thing. So to capture 8x, we need, oh, uh, Aaron, uh, my brain. We want to capture the height. And the hardest question of the day, how do I measure the height? Thermometer. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God, no! My who who was your geometry teacher? They must have been garbage dirt. If you're measuring length with a thermometer, and actually, the, if you major in physics, I don't want to get into this. You can measure length with a thermometer if you do enough math. But let's, this is this is neither this is neither. If you take a laser and you bounce it off a mirror, and then you have that laser then hit a thermometer, you could indirectly measure the distance from the laser to the thermometer with the thermometer. Let's not get into it. Um, <laughs> nonetheless, yeah, we use a meter stick. Um, and then what else do we need here? The masses. Yeah, that's easy. Mass. Um, and then that's going to be uh, MX and MY. Technically, they want you to write it that way. You got to capture both. And how do we measure mass? Scale. Yeah, yeah scale. Uh, be vague. Just say scale. Uh, you could say balance beam if you're going old school and analog. You could say digital scale if you go to a private school. Uh, but, you know, no need to go into any detail. What else are we going to need here? And this is where I'm glad we did it in this order because there's now like different paths you could take. Do you need the velocity, right? We need the velocity, which we can measure either directly or indirectly. So the easy way is to talk about what would happen if we measured it directly. So that would be to say that we want the velocity, which we're calling V. <clears throat> Sorry, let me, the light just dimmed. Um, and how would we measure velocity directly since we attend a you know, well-to-do private school? A motion detector. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, motion detector, or if you like write on their Vernier tablet, Vernier's <laughs> stock prices will go up a little bit or something. Um, or how could we measure the velocity indirectly? So this constitutes a complete set, right, where these first two bits, this is mandatory, and it's got to be this plus 
this. Um, so this works, this is good to go. The other thing that we could do is we could measure the velocity indirectly. Now, once the system is moving together, is it accelerating? No. It is not. So once the collision occurs, once it's block X stuck to block Y, this is moving with constant velocity. Uh, that is by Newton's laws. There's no friction. The problem says this is a magical frictionless air hockey table. Um, and without any friction, there should be no negative acceleration. So since we're moving with constant velocity, this is the case where A is equal to zero. So therefore, we can actually say velocity is just distance divided by time. So if you were to measure this velocity old school, like it's the 1800s, how would we do it with this information? What two things would you have to collect to indirectly calculate velocity? Time or meter stick. Very good. You need delta x. Uh, so we would need to measure displacement. And we would also need to measure time elapsed which would be our delta x and our delta t, which would be either to relist meter stick or to get another meter stick. Or one of the men in college labs, we have two meter sticks. Those things are weird. They're just a little bit taller than me, and I always do that thing where you hold it in the middle and like wobble it because the ends flex because it's so long. Uh, and we also measure time with a stopwatch. Um, so a correct answer to the second part, one is mandatory, but either item for two will give full credit. So full credit is given for this question either uh, with anything which would constitute a one and a two. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. And I think at this point, man, we've had so much practice talking about the procedures. We should be cool with that part. So we measure the masses. We set up the block at the top of the ramp. We measure the height, right? Always talk about when you measure stuff. So for procedure, uh, number one, I would measure mass first. Number two, I would uh, lift up X, measure height. Uh, I would then release it, and then measure V. How you measure V is based on what materials you talk about. So if it's that motion detector, you just measure it directly. If it's not the motion detector, then you would uh, use the stopwatch uh, to time the amount of time that it takes to travel a meter or however you wanna phrase it. Use stopwatch to time uh, uh, travel over one meter. Uh, and then, of course, compare our values, but doing math shouldn't go into the procedure. It's just the stuff that we need to collect in order to have the numbers to do the math. So these are the things that we should be collecting. Uh, anyway, that's about it for that question. Um, are there any questions on item one from unit five? No? Okay. Uh, on Monday, we'll go over item two from unit five, but since next week is our last week of review and we're nearing the end, um, things will go fast. So just so y'all know, I'm going to be assigning unit six and seven. One is about uh, rotation, and then one is about uh, oscillation, and then we'll be doing tutorials for those next week. And then I think we will have reviewed this test to death, man. We've gone through the class once slowly, and now we're about to turn the corner on going through it twice quickly. Um, so, you know, keep up with the practice and best of luck to you and, uh, on not just this exam, but all of your AP tests coming up in the next few weeks. Um, I will see y'all on Monday. Be sure to upload your classwork, your notes on proving out the tennis ball basketball question. And if you've fallen behind, you know, get caught up as soon as possible. The AP test is right around the corner. Uh, I will see you guys on Monday. Thank you. Thank you.